Hi, my name is Noah Gift, and I'm the author of Practical ML Ops, a book by O'Reilly on operationalizing machine learning. And today, I'm going to talk to you about some of the latest things that are happening with ML Ops. I'm going to start at the theory, like what are some of the things that are happening uh, in the ML Ops space? What are the core foundational knowledge that you need? And then after that, I get into building the skills necessary. So I get into DevOps, go into how to use DevOps. Then I move into deploying a very simple scikit-learn model with AWS and all the AWS tools. And then I, towards the end, get into a survey of different platforms and actually kicking the tires with those. So I get into uh, the Databricks platform and do MLOps with Databricks, I get into some of the things that you can do with SageMaker, for example, AutoML. And I also use ML Run, an open source uh, MLOps framework, and I, I use that to actually do some experiment tracking. All right, let's go ahead and get started. From, from really for me, the MLOps from zero with platforms uh, is, is where I'm at in the MLOps journey now. And to start with, uh, as we, we talked about before, I have a lot of experience in the university system, but a lot of my career started off in uh, working in the film industry, actually, when I was in Southern California. And one of the things I did that gave me a lot of insight into MLOps and DevOps is uh, working for Disney Feature Animation on their first 3D animation pipeline where they used... Uh, network systems that had data in a central repository and there was big distributed computers that would render the, the frames. And that's really the same kind of work that we do with data engineering, machine learning engineering, uh, and DevOps. And in some sense, you could say that the film industry was one of the early adopters of data engineering. Recently, I've written eight books, uh, including three for O'Reilly. In fact, I have a fourth one that I'm working on on AWS with C Sharp. And then uh, from 2013 to 16, I built a sports social media company with millions of users. And that gave me a lot of insight into, in fact, some of the challenges that the world is facing today with uh, social media. Uh, I, I was able to experience some of those same issues. Uh, and then from really about 2017 until today, I've been doing consulting and focusing on creating content. Currently, I'm at Duke working in their AI product innovation and also the uh, data science program at Duke uh, and focus mostly on cloud computing and uh, MLOps. Those are really my, my two areas uh, of focus. And I am actually uh, have some other things I'm working on in MLOps that I will announce in maybe a few weeks or so. So why MLOps? I think this is a good place to start. Uh, and in particular, you know, in, in terms of the agenda, I'm going to talk about why we why we need to care about MLOps. What are some of the use cases of MLOps, and also the strategy uh, behind how an organization could adopt MLOps, and then uh, some Q and A as well. So to to start with this, uh, you know, why MLOps here? I think. In terms of the motivation, uh, one of the things that is very interesting is that there's a lot of data scientists, but not necessarily a lot of models into production. And that's, to me, one of the, the key issues with MLOps. And also, if we do uh, go ahead and have a recession or, you know, eventually everything, you know, everything is cyclical, right? So though there's ups and downs. There may be more of a focus on uh, getting things into production, getting ROI for the things that you've been spending time with as a data scientist or a data engineer. Also, I think if we look at the COVID-19 crisis, you know, really a unique period of time in history, it revealed that there are times in the history of humanity where you need to move a lot quicker and developing vaccines, developing therapies. That's a great example of things that the world could move faster on and MLOps could be part of the solution. So, one of the questions here is how do you get started with MLOps and then also what are the MLOps platforms that uh, you can use? So I'm going to cover uh, all of these topics. So for, first though, let me set a little bit of context here around where things are headed. And I've been seeing this trend for quite some time is that the Wall Street Journal 
on October 6th of 2020 reported that there were close to a million jobs in cloud that that essentially doubled from the year before. And I don't know what the current uh, jobs uh, are outstanding are for 2022, but uh, I'm assuming it's going to be even more than uh, that that million number. So it looks like there's some really tremendous growth in terms of cloud computing. And then in terms of some of these other roles, uh, data engineer, we've also seen huge rise in companies hiring data engineers and also huge rise in companies hiring machine learning engineers. What we don't see is really that that same rise in data science. And, and it doesn't necessarily mean that data science is a bad um, skill set. In fact, it's a, it's a critical skill set. But what it may be is that data science is, is more of a behavior or a capability versus a job title. And, and I, th- I think that is what we're seeing is that maybe a data engineer does data science related tasks or a machine learning engineer does uh, data science related tasks. Uh, but there's maybe a little bit less of a, of, a, of a need for someone who just does strictly data science as itself. It's more of integrated into other things that are happening. So I think that's really the trend that we are seeing is that this is why MLOps is such a big deal is that there's a rise of, of putting things into production. So if we look at uh, DevOps and MLOps in particular, one of the things that I, w- I find a little bit amusing when people talk about ML engineering or MLOps is, you know, is it data centric or is it model centric, et cetera. And I think part of it is, I feel like you're missing the, the story here, which is that before we even get into, is it data centric or model centric, do you have DevOps? Uh, and this is my, um, I guess, experience here is that having worked at many companies in the Bay Area, uh, working in large-scale film uh, you know, industries, that if you can't automate your software engineering practices and continuously make things better, you can't do anything. And so I think it's important before we get into the details of model-centric or data-centric is to say, hold on a second. Do you actually have continuous integration, continuous delivery? If you don't, we can't even talk about the next steps. And so this is what I would call the email engineering uh, hierarchy of needs, right? Is to develop the, the DevOps capabilities first. Now, once you do have the DevOps capabilities, the next step would be the data automation. And I'll get into this in a little bit, but how can you possibly do machine learning operations if your data is a mess, right? You, you can't. So you need to have automation there as well. And then I think when we get into email engineering, this is where uh, it can you can really go down a dark road if you try to build everything yourself. And there's just too much complexity with machine learning to do every single thing yourself. It's much better to use a platform. A lot of times those platforms live in the cloud or associated with the cloud. Finally, once you've done that, then you're you're able to actually get into MLOps. So let's get into this concept of continuous delivery for MLOps. And, and this is, I think, a, a very important diagram to take a look at is if you're maybe coming from business analytics or you're coming from data science, you may not have been familiar with this kind of workflow. But with cloud computing in particular, one of the things that cloud computing enables is this concept of in number of environments, meaning that you can set up really an infinite number of environments because the cloud itself uh, is virtual. So there's virtual networking, there's virtual storage, there's virtual compute. And also if you use infrastructure as code, so in the case of AWS, you use uh, CDK, you can actually programmatically define the infrastructure and actually push a new uh, environment into any of these uh, locations in the cloud, do load tests on them, essentially have exactly the production environment uh, mimicked. So the concept here is that you're continuously improving, you're doing automatic uh, deployments, and you also can deploy it to exactly the same environment as as the, your development environments. Now, uh, as I mentioned earlier in the hierarchy of needs here, if we get into this concept of data operations here, a good way to think about it 
is this concept of a water hookup. If you don't have water, you can't build advanced uh, appliances in your house, right? So uh, if you don't have the water coming into uh, your house, you don't have a treatment plant, you can't possibly have a dishwasher, a washing machine, uh, a jacuzzi, a pool, all those kinds of fancy things that happen uh, in, a, in a house. You need to have a water hookup. Similarly, if you want to do machine learning, really this is a fundamental component is how do I get the data into my organization? How do I do periodic data collection jobs? Uh, what is a data feature store, a serverless data engineering system, a big data processing system, an ML model versioning system? These are all the kind of functionalities that are available with uh, data operations. And in particular, I think one of the ones that many people are talking about now is a uh, data engineering uh, feature store. And in particular, the uh, feature store is really a, kind of an enhanced version of a database that you would use in order to speed up many parts of your machine learning pipelines, uh, just like how you would use potentially a data warehouse to speed up potentially queries for business analytics. And we'll get into this in a second. Another thing, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of the hierarchy of needs here is that the platform automation is a very difficult task. And if you're not using some kind of platform, then you're going to have issues because you will have to reproduce a very large distributed system. And this is not ideal to recreate it. Instead, you want a system to do all of the work for you. So if we take a look here, for example, at, um, this diagram, this is a kind of a, a generic uh, SageMaker project that I went through and I captured all of the different states of the project and I put them into this diagram where you see that I retrieve data from S3. I do exploratory data analysis uh, on the file uh, and then I go through and I do some modeling and then uh, once the modeling is completed, uh, I can actually go ahead and do predictions with it. So that's that's really the, the typical data science workflow. But in the real world, what do we do here in terms of data science workflow? Well, we have, uh, in fact, the SageMaker notebook is, is actually being run underneath the hood by a machine, right? So there's something that's, that is actually available. When I do exploratory data analysis, I scale the data, I dr drop it, right? There are m other machines that are actually getting spun up. In the case of uh, principal component analysis or k-means clustering, those also have machines spun up, maybe a cluster of different machines here. Uh, and then when I've gone through and I've uh, actually persisted the model, the model goes and it lives inside of Amazon S3. Now, a few things to point out here would be that depending on the size of your data, even if you did recreate this entire system yourself and build, I don't know, your own Kubernetes workflows for this, that you have to have distributed storage now that can actually handle that workload. And so this is what Amazon S3 does, is it is it uses the power of the concept of essentially infinite disk IO and infinite storage to allow you to create workflows on top. So really, in the real world, it's not possible to do these kinds of things on a system that isn't distributed by its own nature. You have to be working on top of something that's distributed, right? There, there, there really is a bottleneck there without it. Once you've gone through and you've um, saved out your model, uh, then you can actually distribute those to, let's say another cluster of machines, which could, and there could be multiple clusters of machines, depending on how, how many models that you're actually uh, building. And in this particular example here, you know, there's a k-means clustering endpoint, and there's a principal component analysis endpoint, and then you would serve that onto into production. So this is just one particular platform, and but it does show the the concept of really the ideal scenario is build it, build whatever you're doing on top of cloud computing, and there really isn't another option for for most projects, and also use some kind of a platform. There's tons of platforms for machine learning so that you can focus on the problem, not focus on, uh, you know, essentially reinventing the wheel. So what about the feedback loop that is necessary for MLOps? Well, part of it is that you want to both create the model, 
but it's not just static. You also need to retrain the model with reusable ML pipelines. Uh, and so uh, in this particular scenario here, we have the monitoring, we have the training and retraining the model, the deploy and versioning, and we audit trail and artifacts. So this is a continuous delivery of ML models. You would audit, have an audit trail for an ML ops pipeline, and you would observe the model data drift to use to improve future models. So the, the idea here is that just like in DevOps, you don't build software and then just walk away. You have to actually continuously build new solutions, look at what's happening when your model's in production, observe, you know, is there a bunch of new data? Should I retrain the model as a result? What is the model doing in production? It's a feedback loop, not a static system. So it would be a, potentially a tree, like a redwood tree versus a bridge, right? They're two totally different things. A bridge does need maintenance, but it's been built once. You don't necessarily build it multiple times. A tree is an organic system. It's gonna need constant feedback, monitoring, and different inputs, sun, soil, water. Another concept that I'm seeing uh, quite a bit as well is why would you want to build more than one thing? Uh, and so it really you, you wanna have the ability to create once and deploy many. And we can see this with different systems. For example, like uh, Google Vertex AI has the ability to train something once and then deploy to many different devices like a, an iPhone, an Android device, a JavaScript. In fact, just to take, take a, a look at this, if I go to Tensor, TensorFlow Hub here, and we take a look at their concept of the world, one of the, the neat things about this is you can go through here, download all these models. But if I just click on you know one of these models here like this, uh, I could I could download it. But look, it's available for me in many different formats, and so uh, I could actually go through here, and if I wanted to uh, run it in a Colab notebook, but or I could also run it in a JavaScript a library. So if we go through here and we go to one of these other models here, like uh, here we go. You can see this one runs in Android Studio. Uh, basically, they have lots of different examples uh, of, of you know, tiny models, TF Lite, models that work with JavaScript, mo models that work with edge-based devices. So you don't necessarily want to recreate everything every single time. Ideally, what would happen uh, is that you would actually create it once and actually be able to use it in many different formats here, like use with MLKit, use with Android Studio, use with TF Lite. And, and, and I think this is really a new concept as well, is, is, is have the ability to create it once, but to deploy to many different uh, devices or platforms, JavaScript, backends, mobile devices. And, and this is why I get into my personal opinion of what MLOps is is that I think saying things are data centric or model centric, which is I think one of the trends that people are talking about, I think is missing the point, which is there is no silver bullet. Anybody that has built production software realizes that there is no one answer to all, you know, in the software industry has had many examples of this, like object-oriented programming was at one point a silver bullet, turns out, you can abuse that. And in fact, I've worked on places where they had an abusive object oriented programming and, and it can, it, without some constraints, it can cause problems. Similarly, we've seen this with testing, right? Testing is good, but what if you go too far and you go to um, basically test driven development? I think that's actually been a failure. I don't think anybody does test driven development for the most part. Uh, that's too extreme. Likewise, people talk about uh, Scrum. Uh, Scrum, you know, I think some of the concepts are interesting, you know, about having sprints and doing weekly planning, planning, but many people hate working in Scrum because it's a very repressive environment. So, so essentially, anytime you hear someone talk about a silver bullet, which again, to me is data centric, model centric, et cetera centric, is that the, maybe they're missing some of the context of, uh, maybe they don't have experience building real world systems. When you have experience building real world systems, what you'll find out is that there is no answer, right? Unfortunately, there there are techniques that you can use together, but they, you need to actually have a holistic approach. And I think this is the way to think about MLOps is 
25% of the problem is DevOps. So again, if you don't have DevOps, you can't do MLOps. 25% of the problem is data. If you don't have data, how can you possibly do MLOps? You need to actually make sure the data is clean, high quality, et cetera, maybe use feature stores. And then when you get into the models as well, 25% of the models, uh, obviously if you're doing machine learning operations, you don't have a model, you can't do machine learning. But then here's the other part that I think the, the model centric versus data centric um, question really misses is that are you actually going to the, the business stakeholders and actually clarifying the problem that you're trying to work on, clarifying the ROI? Uh, a good example would be Zillow. There was this house flipping model that they created, but did they really walk through you know, back and forth with the data team? and the the business team to make sure that there there actually was a uniformed you know idea for what the problem was that they're trying to solve so if you're even if you did devops right data right models right it's possible you could still create a problem because you you were not working on the right problem right and so to me this is really what ml ops is is to equally weight those four quadrants and if you do that then in my opinion you're doing ml ops Okay, let's talk a little bit about some of the use cases of MLOps here. So when would you want to use MLOps? Well, I think autonomous vehicles are a good example. Uh, it may be a bad example as well because it's still kind of a controversial area. But basically with autonomous vehicles, uh, you see there's a real-time feedback loop. When I've been able to visit companies that do autonomous vehicles, they, they do have the concept of MLOps. I would say it's probably one of the most you know, pervasive or one of the best examples of MLOps would be autonomous vehicles because they're they're collecting new data and they're constantly putting the data back into production. Uh, also, implementing something for the first time, I would say this would be a use case, you know, maybe going to a university or going to someone that does a lot of research and then really working with that organization to, to uh, basically increase their productivity by creating models. I think that would be a great... Uh, use case for MLOps. Computer vision is another one where uh, in the case of computer vision, you would actually be going through and uh, solving real world problems like object detection, facial detection. And then, uh, as I mentioned before, really this, the real world versus the research, this is a good place for MLOps. So uh, if we go into strategy here, I think this is another important concept when you're talking to an organization about MLOps is what is your strategy, not just what is the technique. And as I mentioned before, I, I think it's easy to get into the mindset that every single thing that you're doing uh, needs to be a perfect solution. It, it really could be better served to be iterative. So you you go through and you you find solutions that make things better. You increase your automation, but the concept of there being a silver bullet solution is, I think, a bad strategy to to think about. So one of the ways you could do this is to think about like a primary investment and a secondary investment. Um, so a primary investment would be that it has low cost, is popular, maybe it's easy to hire, there's breadth, is easy to build. Uh, an abstraction on top of, and then a secondary one would be it solves one problem very well. So this would be maybe a, a commercial platform like Databricks or Splunk or Snowflake. Maybe it solves one particular part of the problem, you know, in a way that is unique and it allows you to solve for something that's really been troublesome for you. And then you could think about investment right, which is you don't know yet if it'll pay off. Maybe it's more of an R&D focus, but you focus on potentially technical, technological innovation. So maybe some advanced deep learning technology, maybe doing things with Kubernetes, uh, potentially using like edge-based computing models, also potentially using maybe a pre-trained model like Hugging Face. There's a lot of innovation there about using pre-trained models. So I think this is really important to think about which is easy to for people not to think about you know the strategy of what they're doing because they're caught up in you know going to Kaggle and finding the the best hyperparameters but if you're going to implement this in your company the primary in particular is a really important one to think about 
is that is it actually low cost and and is it popular enough that you can hire people if you can't hire people to use the thing that you're use that you're building you're basically dead in the water no matter how good it is and then also in terms of the secondary are you picking a solution that really solves a problem that helps your business so a couple things to consider here in terms of primary consideration is that in at least in terms of uh, cloud computing you know amazon is definitely the leader uh, and if you're doing data science for a living and you don't look at data to make decisions that's not a good start to implementing mlops right and so we got to look at the data what does the data say well it, it's pretty clear here that the two top leaders are are um, really way ahead so if we look at aws they have 33 percent of the market share q4 2021 we have uh, azure that has 21 percent. so really they they're over 50 percent of the market everybody else below is really a niche player so google cloud has some interesting things but again for my uh, the way i look at the world there would have to be a very compelling reason for me to not pick one of the top two vendors because of hiring right and that, that's really the issue here is is can i get enough people even if it is something that sounds really compelling and then the other thing to consider is also enterprise support and i think this is also where aws and azure can can play a huge role is that you can actually get support for your organization also industry standard certifications i currently have uh you know lots of aws certifications and i've built training courses for aws certifications so i, I and i've trained students in fact all, all over the world to to be certified in aws and and uh, i think they're they're one of the the companies that has done the certification uh quite well uh, and it's also easy to hire people because you can look for certifications right so you know at least they have some core capabilities and also it's easy to train your staff right if you want to retain people in your organization i think that's a great way to retain people is to encourage them to get certifications pay for their certifications so i think this is important to to consider now what about the the secondary considerations here you know what should you what should you think about so does a platform make things easier for a specific aspect of a job and so in the case of databricks what they do well is spark based etl so that that could be a good solution to pick if it's uh log search maybe it's a splunk uh, based log search if it's monitoring uh, you can go ahead and pick potentially a company like Data, Datadog. These are just examples. They're, they're going to be unique to your organization. This is a, a picture here of the, the Data50 uh, you know, diagram here that shows some of the different platforms here. But I think it is important to, to think about that concept. What is the specific problem, maybe the secondary tool that I'm using is solving? And also again back to the hiring you know is it both on, on both sides both as the employee and also as the employer is it easy to hire and train people right that's and do they have popular certifications right these are these are critical questions to ask and then do they synthesize well with a primary platform i think that's a the key consideration so now let's talk a little bit about the hiring and upskill strategy for an organization uh, and I would say in general, in fact, um, it's a good idea to get a subscription to a learning platform like, for example, O'Reilly. And in particular, I would say, you know, get maybe even more than one. And the reason for this is that a lot of the, the, the latest information is on a learning platform by, you know, some of the most talented people in the world who are experts in what they do. I would encourage the companies to, to build out certifications and also for companies to have internal user groups where you do a monthly tech talk and maybe a demo and then you have yearly and quarterly your um, learning goals as well i think that's a great idea is, is if you don't have some kind of a goal set for your organization let's say in terms of ml ops and what it is you're going to acquire it's it's difficult to to make progress and i would even say that companies should pay people to learn maybe give them bonuses or or give them some kind of reward uh, to to acquire these skills and then also I would encourage demos this is also really important is that 
if you have some kind of a weekly demo in your organization, it encourages metacognition. And, and there's a good book on it that I just read recently called Know Thyself, The Science of Self-Awareness. It talks about how demos increase the person that's giving the demos uh, knowledge, right? So by teaching it to other people, you're able to, to realize what it is you do know and you don't know. And also there's a side benefit, which is that other people get to see the new information. So there's a great feedback loop by encouraging uh, demos in your organization. So here's some ideas here for key certifications for MLOps. I would say that uh, AWS uh, machine learning uh, specialty would be one that would be a, a great one to get uh, because it covers machine learning on the AWS platform. And it's a good, it's a, I think it's a good industry standard certification. Uh, Solutions Architect is another one. I have uh, actually built material around this on the O'Reilly platform where you can learn about uh, AWS and data analytics, right? These are some good ones that I think are, are well established in, in adding value to both an employer and an employee. Others, here's some ideas here, you know, you know Snowflake getting a, a certification that's a, a hot uh, data management platform. There's also Databricks uh, certified developer that could be a good one to get. Also the Google Cloud uh, has a machine learning engineer certification. So e again, even though maybe some of these are niche players and maybe you don't even necessarily do something with them, uh, it could be nice to at least give you the perspective where you went deep enough to pass the certification so you, you can actually give good advice to your organization. Here's some future trends with MLOps that I wanted to talk about that are that are kind of interesting. And one of the ones I, I think that's that's not really been talked about a lot is this concept of NFS operations. And we're seeing this actually quite a bit uh, with the emergence of the managed file system across cloud vendors. And AWS actually has a couple different vendors that uh, are options. They have FSX and they also have EFS. And one of the things that's really interesting about this is that it enables workflows that are very different than potentially a Hadoop-based file system. So the developer could go through here, build out some stuff in GitHub, and then if they wanted to uh, actually send a notification to, let's say, a Jenkins uh, instance that uh, is your build surfer or even AWS uh, cloud build uh, or code build, and then what happens is because the Elastic file system is the source of truth, that this uh, Jenkins instance, or again, AWS code build, could just do an rsync to sync maybe the scripts to the EFS file system. Your web server or even your deep learning nodes automatically have access to this, uh, or maybe a Kubernetes cluster or something like this. And, and basically, it, it, it means that there's a persistent source of truth inside of your distributed system. And I think this is an emerging trend here for both data engineering and machine learning engineering that, that could could be very interesting to see you know where this heads. And I, and I actually personally use this for a organization that did computer vision. Uh, another one that we're seeing uh, kind of start to emerge here as well is this concept of a Kubernetes and Kubeflow uh, concepts and what, what what we're seeing here is that there are many machine learning platforms being built on top of Kubernetes and and this could be a strong uh, use case for for building MLOps solutions. You could even say like one of the primary uses for Kubernetes could be building machine learning platforms. And so there are platforms being built on top of Kubernetes uh, that are that are pretty interesting and. In particular, Kubernetes, what's nice about it is that it runs uh, very well with uh, GCP, AWS, Azure, on-prem, local, right? These are, these are all, you know, some of the concepts that are, that are headed our way. Now, also, I'll mention that I'm going to demo a platform that has some Kubernetes uh, aspects with it as well. So let's do a, a comparison here of some of the MLOps platforms. Uh, so to start with, one of the, the I would say, the 
the largest platforms available is SageMaker. And you can see here that in, in some sense, it's almost like a, it's almost like a protocol, you know, organization, you know, where, where they're, they're developing some of the terms and, and, and some of the industry standards. And even if you don't use SageMaker, maybe you should know about SageMaker. And you can see here kind of the world that they're, they're looking towards, which is feature authoring, SageMaker Data Wrangler, feature discovery, SageMaker Studio, online inference, you know, SageMaker hosting, Lambda training, batch scoring, you know, SageMaker training. Uh, you can also see it's got integration with Apache Airflow, SageMaker pipelines, step functions, streaming with uh, Kafka or Kinesis. And then inside of here, we also have a SageMaker feature store. So just from that perspective alone, it's kind of an interesting thing to, to consider is, is that you can actually use, um, kind of look at what SageMaker is doing and, and probably some of those things are happening in industry. Another one that uh, I will be able to show a little bit today is Azure ML Studio. And the, the core concept here is that you have the Azure Cloud assets, resources, and then you have this ML Studio, which has a designer, it has a notebook, it has AutoML, and it has data labeling. And, and so it, it, it also is a pretty you know, reasonable platform to, to kind of build solutions off of. And in particular, some of the features that Azure Machine Learning Studio has is notebooks. Really, that's one of the ways you can tell about any platform is that they have a notebook integration inside of it. That's, that means it's a serious platform. Uh, Azure Machine Learning uh, Designer, so you can actually do drag and drop. Also automated machine learning UI, and then also data labeling. Uh, Azure Cloud itself, some of the things that you can do with it uh, that are pretty interesting is you can have models, data sets, data stores, compute resources, notebook, experiments. You can run logs, you can do pipelines, pipeline endpoints. So there's a lot of core capability that then allows machine learning platforms to build directly on top of the Azure Cloud. Another one that is a smaller one that is is still interesting is the Google Vertex AI. It's gone through a lot of different iterations, but you know their their view of the world here is you do ML development, you then go into data processing, you then uh, have operationalized training, you then go to model serving, uh, and then you orchestrate your ML workflow. You have artifact organization, and then you have model monitoring. Now, there's also another platform that I've been playing around with as well called uh, Aguazio's ML Run. Uh, and uh, here's an example of some of the stuff that they're doing, which I think is interesting, is they have this concept of uh, a research environment uh, where there is a manual uh, extraction. Uh, there's in-memory, small-scale training, right? So we know these are some of the bottlenecks, but a production pipeline has to have very different things. So this is kind of the way the, they, they see why 85% of projects never make it to production uh, is that you need real-time ingestion. You need preparation of scale. You need to train with many parameters and large data. You also need to serve with real-time data. You need to monitor it. But operationalizing ML is a challenge in particular because people are siloed here, right? So if the data scientists have no idea what DevOps is, or even what data engineering is, it, you've got a problem. The process could be too lengthy. The access to the features, like preparing features is, is a real uh, complex and time consuming process. And then also finally, does it even work? And so the concept here is that they're going from real time and batch to ingestion, transform training, deploying, uh, here's some of their customers, but in particular, the thing I like about what they're talking about is this interactive or iterative, uh, model development. Uh, and, and really what they're, they're mentioning here, which I agree with is that, uh, productizing ML is exponentially harder than just building, you know, a, a toy example. And, and you can see here, there's a ton of things involved with data and feature engineering, uh, with data operations, with continuous delivery, uh, with monitoring, maybe enriching the model uh, via real-time uh, application pipeline. 
And so one of the approaches, which you'll see not just in the ML Run uh, platform, but also with SageMaker, some of the other platforms, is there's now becoming this concept of a production first mindset, right? So if you build the production pipeline from the very beginning, then you're, you're getting rid of some of these silos. So you have BI and data exploration, notebooks, training, AutoML, CI, CD frameworks, governance. If it's all built in from the beginning and you have a production uh, MLOps pipeline, then that, that really could be one of the solutions uh, to, to be implemented. And so this is their view of the world. One click automated uh, and feature store are, 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 uh, are one of their components. So you'll see this a lot as well, is that many MLOps platforms do, are doing a feature store which is where the features are kept so that you can you know, increase productivity. There's real-time serving pipeline, monitoring your training, and CI, CD. Uh, and feature store here, you can see a, one of the benefits is that you're able to actually uh, reuse features, share them with other people, and, re, and, and basically enable retraining directly from production data. Uh, you also could have online serverless pipeline. That's another key capability and also do drift detection and auto retraining. Uh, these are also things that I'm seeing a lot in platforms and also end-to-end -end automation for you know rolling out new features. Another one that I'll just briefly talk about that I'll also cover a little bit today is um, the Spark. And some of the concepts behind Spark, Databricks clusters are, uh, you know, that we need to talk a little bit about distributed computing and in particular, some of the issues that are happening with uh, distributed computing uh, uh, are that Python, native Python, is very, very slow. Uh, Moore's law is over, and also Omdel's law isn't a, a silver bullet. Uh, and there are platforms that must have some kind of hardware-based uh, acceleration. <clears throat> we have uh, essentially current issues in distributed computing. As I mentioned, native Python is slow. Moore's law is over. Omdel's law isn't a silver bullet. We also need hardware uh, platforms like specialized chips. Apple M1 is a, a great example of this. So, so what what are the issues here? Well, one of the problems is that native Python Python is very very slow, and it can have let's say sixty four thousand times worse than matrix operations in C. Uh, and this is actually from Dr. David Patterson from UC Berkeley, who's a, a, a basically a chip architect at, at Google now. Uh, and he talked about how on an 18 core machine, uh, you know, depending on what it is you're doing, that you know, 64,000 times worse performance is a real issue. And so one of the issues here is that that there are these challenges and opportunities in distributed computing. And basically, as of 2015, Moore's law is over, and the gains are basically at 3% a year. And as a result here, and this is from Dr. Dr. David Patterson, is that if you look at 40 years of performance, we've gone logarithmic, right? So we, we, we had a period of time where we were linear, and then th start, things start to slow, and now we're, we're basically... Uh, capped out and this is a problem in terms of using uh, the cpu for, for things we need to use other solutions as i mentioned before as well with omdel's law one of the issues is that there's diminishing returns to parallelism so basically there's no free lunch anymore in that essentially the speed up where well where you think that you're going to get a lot of uh, performance increase by adding cores, but you can see depending on how parallel the code is, you know, like in the case of 50% parallelization, right after let's say eight cores, nothing happens anymore. Like there's almost no speed up, and you're only getting close to two times speed up from eight cores. Even in the case of something that's almost completely parallel, you see you're only getting let's say a 10, uh, you know, a little less than 10x speed up with 16 cores, and it just keeps getting worse and worse. You know, like if you say 64 core machine, now you're only getting, you know, let's say 15 times speed up. Uh, and, and there's diminishing returns here be because of the fact that your code is in parallel. You can't 
increase par- you can't speed up a sleep for example or a, a weight on disk or a network operation so one of the solutions to this is the asic and this is w- what we're seeing here is that gpus tpus specialized chips these are all you know becoming uh, w- one of the solutions the inference as well is something you could do on a chip like this like this uh, intel movidius or the the coral chip and all of these ideas around specific hardware, I think, are great uh, approaches. Uh, now, one of the things that would be interesting to to demo here a little bit is how you can actually create uh, things very easily by using a combination of all of these uh, devices here. And so I think that would be a good thing for me to demo next here is to do a little bit of uh, create ML. And so I'm going to go ahead and uh, do that. I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, change to a new demo. Let's go ahead and open up Xcode. Okay. All right. Create ML. Okay. And then now I'm going to change my screen here to share this here we go let's try this okay so this is a tool from apple that is called create ml and What's neat about it is that it does a lot of the things I, I talked about earlier. It's got uh, automation, it's got platforms, it's also got the ability to use the Apple hardware to build specialized uh, you know, approaches to solving machine learning problems. And, and that's why I really think it's kind of cool is look at all the different problems you can solve, right? You can do image classification, you can do object detection, you can do style transfer. And again, it's using this ASIC. I have the Apple uh, M1 laptop here, and it's able to actually utilize that to create very, very performance training and also very, very performance um, uh, inference. And so if we go and I look at this image classification and I, and I go next here, uh, I could just call this uh, dogs and cats and then go next and uh, what I'll do here is I just need to find uh, the dogs and cats data, which I think I have on my machine here. Let's see, dogs and cats. There we go, D- dogs and cats small. Let's go ahead and do that. And let me just share my screen one more time since it went away. Here we go. Okay, so what it'll do is it'll open up this uh, window here, which is our which is a training window that lets me build everything that I need directly inside of inside of this uh, interface. And in particular, what I can do is uh, I can actually drag some training data right here. Uh, uh-oh, dogs and cats small. Let's go ahead and find our data here. Let's do this. There we go. Let's drag the training data right here there we go so we're able to find two classes with 200 items and i can even view it and it shows me the labels so all it is is it looks at the directories that are inside so so very very easy problem to to solve here is is you just you just put a directory with um, folders inside and those are your classes and then if i want to train it Notice I have the ability to add noise, blur, cropping. I can do all kinds of really cool stuff to it uh, as well. And then uh, when I click on train, it'll go through here and it'll extract the features and process those. And in fact, it'll show me how quickly it was able to actually create, train a model. And we have validation accuracy of 96.8%. And if I look at the evaluation here, uh, I could actually put testing data if I wanted to do that, but I also can just start doing predictions on the model as well. So if I want to go through here and uh, you know grab uh, some kind of a picture of a cat or a dog, I can I can just throw 
throw one of those on, on top of here and it goes cat, 100% confidence. If I go through here and I find dog, right? We can see dog, 100% confidence. So these kinds of tools, I think, are, are basically becoming you know, pervasive. Uh, and again, they're using the platform plus the, the, the specific chips. And one of the things that I think many people don't know is that, that one, it's, it's very performant. Two, the size is very small. And also, I can actually uh, download this model. And it, be, and it comes into a ML uh, format, like .ml model format. And I can actually convert this very easily into some other format like Onyx and then serve that out and, and, and create a, a prediction model. So these, I think, tools are definitely worth being aware of, right, is these, these kind of integrated platforms that use uh, specialized chips. And especially because of the fact that I can just take this and put this into an iOS app. Uh, as well as building it into an API. So let's go back to our slides here and we'll, we'll keep going. So I'm going to go to, here we go. Okay, so that was uh, Create ML. Now, let's, now that we know a little bit of the lay of the land, I wanted to talk a little bit about Databricks, Spark, and clusters. And, and how this also can can play a role. So so Databricks is something that a lot of people are using for ML ops, especially if you are using Spark. So I wanted to just talk a little bit about the clusters, and then later I'll do a demo on this. So the concept uh, of a Databricks cluster really is a bunch of machines that are pulling data from object storage, and I'll talk a little bit about how to manage these. In particular. With uh, Spark clusters, what we'll see is that there's single node, standard, and high concurrency. Uh, and these will actually auto terminate after 120 minutes. And there are also these high concurrency. This would be if you're working somewhere that has you know a lot of different traffic coming to your machine. Maybe you want it always on. Some of the things to be aware of when you are managing clusters, just generically, not just with Spark, is that auto scaling is your friend. You use it to reduce costs compared to a fixed sized cluster. And also you can use a single node for experimenting uh, to control costs. Some of the best practices would be use spot and on demand and also enable auto scaling. Also uh, custom containers are another option, right? You can have libraries built into these custom containers. You can have a golden container environment. You can also integrate with Docker to, to build this out. So distributed computing, uh, these are some of the things that I think are potentially interesting as well. And in, in particular, uh, some of the concepts of why Spark uh, is, is interesting is that it, it is able to actually do things in parallel. And that's, that's really the, one of the core uh, concept concepts and in particular there here's some other uh, examples here that you can you can play around with that that really show this and in, I guess in particular if we look at uh, concurrency here uh, in Python uh, I can talk about a little bit of this and you know, one of the things that um, that we, we can take a look at here is that threads uh, as I like to explain, to people is like the beta pinto of concurrency uh, in Python. It, it really lacks the ability to scale to multiple uh, cores. So typically, you don't want to use threads. There, there is multiprocessing in, in Python, and you can see here as an example of multiprocessing. If I go through here and I, I run this, uh, this is something that uh, is reasonably performance, but it does use a lot of memory. And you can always find out how many cores are in a machine by going CPU core. Uh, Async IO is another example of, of concurrency. So you can do network-based uh, concurrency. Here's an example of, of that. Uh, and, and then finally, you have serverless or function as a service. Uh, and Lambda is, is a good example of that or this FN project, right, where you see people, you know, build these solutions out. Step functions is another one in, in Python. So, so I think really the solution for, for, for a language like Python is to use, again, like a higher level platform 
AWS Batch is another one that is a high level platform. Uh, and, and then in, in general, there's also these um, the, these third party systems like Numba, which can actually make your code do a just in time compiler. Uh, you also can add true multi threading with Numba. And then in terms of uh, GPU, one of the things that that you can do is actually uh, use GPU. And so one of one of the examples here would be in this particular example, if I wanted to vectorize a function, I could target the GPU and I could do some calculations and then and then move it move it back. TPU is another example of of some parallelization here. So there's I think it's important to know that there's a there's really a, a wide variety of concurrency methods, but when you're when you're working with a platform like this, that's really the problem that it's solving. So, in particular, Spark. Uh, one of the cool things about Spark is that uh, it, it can handle distributed computing that allows you to work with uh, bigger bigger data sets. And uh, one of the things that uh, I will have some time, I think, to to show today is that here's one potential thing you could do with a system like Spark is that you would have Databricks. Databricks would uh, potentially talk to, let's say, a Kaggle data set, for example. You could then go ahead and create a uh, table using their distributed file system. So this, again, taps into their concur concurrency. You could go in and, let's say, create an AutoML experiment, register the best model, serve out that model, via a Databricks endpoint. And then inside of a cloud-based development environment, uh, you could develop a containerized version of that model. You could use things like Azure Cloud Shell, AWS Cloud9, GitHub Code Spaces. These are all places where you can play around with this. You could push that to a container registry if you wanted to pull it out of the Databricks environment and then run maybe a, a prediction using a platform as a service offering like AWS App Runner. So this is again why I talk about the primary, secondary, and you could swap this out for anything. This could be ML Run, for example, or it could be, you know, Snowflake or whatever it is you want to tap into. But uh, really, th this is these specialized tools. A lot of times, or it could be SageMaker, allow you to interact with data at scale and also use uh, their their high level, uh, you know, basically platform tools. Another one here that's kind of interesting is that built inside of Databricks, they have this whole ML flow tracking server that does parameters, metrics, artifacts, metadata, models. And you can see that you can use that uh, to, to build out solutions, including automated jobs and REST serving. So, so this is part of their ML ops solution is they use this thing called uh, ML flow. Another thing to consider with platforms like Databricks is that you have workspaces and repositories. And so workspaces would be where you would go through and you'd, you'd create all your code. And then uh, you can also consider that um, they're for team collaboration. So you'll see this, I, I think, really becoming a trend is that you'll have a source control uh, enabled environment where people are working together with a team and you would add users to that environment to enable them to you know, basically share data back and forth, share project files. And repos, I think, are really uh, a must have for, for MLOps and that you want to be working, again, with a production first mindset. Instead of just spinning up notebooks, you, you directly integrate with uh, source control. In particular, with Databricks, they have GitHub, Bit, Bitbucket, GitLab, Azure DevOps, CodeCommit. They have integration with those kinds of pipelines. A few things to remember as well is that you can move from a workspace to a repo and you can even test your codes with version control as well. All right, so those are really the key concepts in terms of the platforms. Now now I think we can get into some of the, the hands-on coding. And in particular, what I can what I can share here is that on the O'Reilly platform, I've actually been able to develop some cool stuff here uh, in terms of an interactive uh, scenario. And I think I can just type in my name here. Yeah, so I have two scenarios here that we can cover. Uh, and basically this scenario, which is test Python project locally to pre prepare for 
continuous integration and continuous delivery. And then also the MLOps uh, fundamentals, uh, building a machine learning API uh, with scikit-learn and Flask. So these are these would be the things that we'll, we'll get to in a second. Bef before I get to those, uh, though, what I want to show is, is some of the core concepts behind DevOps and, and, and what is it and, and how to get started. Then, then we can dive into these two scenarios. So I guess to, to start with, the, the, the core concept to, to really bring up here would be to just to sketch this out and say, you know, like, what is, what is DevOps? I think that's a very important question to, to make sure we have an answer for. And in particular, let's actually go to this one. It's, it's this idea of, of continuous improvement. That, that's what DevOps is. And it's a feedback loop. So if we go through here and, and we build out this, this feedback loop, DevOps is continuous improvement. And either you're static, which, which means you're not doing DevOps, or you're continuously improving. So what we'll call this continuous improvement, continuous. And, and what does it mean to continuously improve? It, it means that you have, uh, let's say, a build system somewhere that has your uh, automation code into it and you also have the source code repository and then you have potentially even a development environment and then you would have your uh, deploy environment so if we put these together we would have let's say git here we would have the build system and we can call this github actions for example, and then you would have, again, this is the, uh, we'll call this Kaizen or continuous improvement. This is the, the feedback loop. And then inside of here, you would have your, your development environment. So we'll call this dev environment. And then we would have your production environment. And so as you're going through and you're building your project, you're constantly testing your, your code uh, in this feedback loop and then deploying both into the development environment. And then when you're ready, you're deploying those changes into the production environment. So to, in order to do this, what I typically recommend is for people to create a scaffold of the core components of a project. And, and again, I'll get into this a little bit with the interactive scenario here. Uh, but you know, typically that would be a make file, maybe a requirements file, some tests. You know, th th those are those are some of the core uh, components to a to a, a, a DevOps uh, project. And then later, as you do deploy, you could also use IAC or infrastructure as code. To, to do your deployment. So let's go ahead and just really quickly build out uh, a repo that, that can do those things inside of it to just get the foundational knowledge here. So what I'll do is I'll go to, to GitHub right here and I'll go ahead and create a new repository in, in GitHub and we'll call this, um, we'll call this DevOps for MLOps. That's kind of a good name for repo. Uh, this demonstrates the core ideas of DevOps. And I can go ahead and add a readme, always a good idea to make sure you have good documentation and then also add uh, a git ignore file for my Python code. And what I will do then is go ahead and create this repository. Okay, great, now I've got this thing set up here. What I can do is, is, is basically um, is build out the rest of this project. So what, what are the, the core components here and how would I even build this out? Well, I, th I think one of the things that I'm going to, that I'll, that I'll uh, do here is show you how a cloud-based development environment solves a lot of problems uh, in interactive environment. So just like how O'Reilly has this interactive scenario here, that you can play around with, that, that's a cloud-based development environment. Similarly, for working in the real world, you, you, you need to pick some kind of, I would, my opinion, a cloud-based environment. So 
uh, since I'm going to do some stuff later today with AWS, let's go ahead and uh, let's build something in an AWS environment. So I'm going to go ahead and open up a console inside of AWS. And there's two different development environments you can use on AWS. One would be the Cloud Shell, which is just a terminal, which you can do a lot with. Or you can also use something called Cloud9. And uh, Cloud9 you can see what it, it says it's a cloud ide for writing running and debugging code so let's go ahead and take a look at this thing and what i can do is just create an environment and we'll call this uh, devops for mlops and just say this is an environment to build out a devops pipeline and, and what's nice about this is I don't have to have a fancy machine. The cloud itself is going to be where I would execute this. And because it's the same environment as production, uh, if I'm using AWS, it eliminates a whole set of problems. Typically, if you're just playing around, I would just leave everything default. Because I'm doing a demo, I'll go ahead and pick a large, which will make it a little bit faster. Notice here the AMIs are... Uh, it gives you a, a few different options. You can use Amazon Linux, 2, Linux 1, or Ubuntu. Again, I would use the defaults. One of the nice things about Cloud9 is that it actually will auto time out after 30 minutes. So we'll go ahead and we'll say next, and we'll create this environment. Usually it takes probably under a minute to set up a cloud nine environments and i'll go ahead and set this up give this just a second here all right so we, we got this connected and you can customize this environment too. I just happen to make it dark theme. You can change the theme. You can do all kinds of stuff. But the, really to get started, what, what, what you need to do is, is first create SSH keys for the very, very first time you ever create an environment. You only need to do this once. We'll just go ahead and do this. Say SSH keygen T R S A. There we go. And we'll paste this. Now, the next thing that I'll do is I'll, I'll find that public key and I'll paste it into my GitHub. So go ahead and grab this key, go back to GitHub and go to settings, go to SSH and GPG keys, paste it in, call this cloud nine. Okay, great. So now let's go back here okay so i got this repo here i'm going to go ahead and select code local and, and i'm, I'm going to clone this via ssh so let's go ahead and copy this and go back to my environment here and just do a git clone there we go and now i'm able to get access to this so the the first thing is to change into the directory and notice that I can look at everything in, in this window right here. And this is where I would start to build out the, the structure. The first thing I would recommend would be to create a Python virtual environment. So in order to do that, I'm going to use Python 3-mvenv and use this, this style right here, which is basically create it into my home directory in an invisible directory since I don't want to look at it. Once I do that, then all I need to do is actually just source this inside of my bash configuration file. So I can go to open up Vim and say tilde dot bash RC. And once I've done that, I do shift G to get to the bottom and then just source the virtual environment. So we'll say source V E and V. So we'll say source tilde slash dot V E and V then activate. And if I go ahead and I, I run this uh, by just uh, closing the window, opening up a new window, new terminal here, notice that now that virtual environment is sourced. 
which means that I don't have to worry about packages being conflicted. And then now I can build out my scaffold. So what are the scaffold steps? It would be make file, requirements file, uh, you know, and some other files here. So let's go ahead and create those. So I'll say touch make file, touch requirements dot txt, and also uh, maybe like a, a main, which would be where I would build my machine learning model serving, and then I would create maybe like a test file right here, like this, right? So th those are probably the core that we would care about. And in terms of the make file here, uh, I have lots of examples here. I can go ahead and uh, grab a make file. Here's one, we can just grab this. And I'm going to go back here and just cut and paste a make file. Typically, once you build a make file, you'll, you'll, you'll reuse a lot of the concepts. So like in this example, pip install, like I, I almost always want to upgrade pip. It then goes through and it looks whatever's in the requirements file. It, it, this test structure here, format structure. So format looks pretty good. And all this does is it will format my Python code to clean it up. And then linting, this would lint my code. Uh, this looks pretty good. And then the all would just run all the steps. So this is really DevOps, right? This is the, the, the beginning of it is get the automation working. So, you know, let's, let's go ahead and uh, put some stuff in the requirements file now. So for the requirements file, typically I use PyTest framework. I use PyLint. And let's say, you know, those are maybe the two things I would care about initially. Uh, maybe, the, oh yeah, also the Python black uh, formatting tool. There we go. And now if I just type in make install, we can see that there is uh, all these packages. Now here's where I would recommend using a tool called pip freeze. And so if I type in pip freeze and I pipe it to less to just look at the output, we can, I can actually grab the version numbers of the tools that I installed so that I, I lessen the chance there'll be a, uh, some kind of a problem reproducing what I'm doing. So this is another step of DevOps is building reproducible systems. So here we go, PyTest, like that. Okay, that looks good. So make install here. Perfect. Now, now that we have, we have make install, uh, I, I've got this working. Now all I need to do is just make something simple in here like a hello script. Let's um, let's go ahead and, and do an add function that could be kind of simple. We can do uh, X and Y and we, and we could say return the uh, X plus Y, right? So the, all this is gonna do is just add two things together, prints. I guess if we wanted to uh, as well, uh, you know, we could we could add a little bit of a document string right here that says, you know, uh, adds two numbers, right, like that. And then we would just print in one and one. Okay, and then if I run this, if I type in Python main, we say one and one uh, because I need to actually uh, make sure that these these are are basically integers, right? Because it's just it's returning back these two things. So we'll, we'll go ahead and we'll say uh, in uh, we'll say sum uh, or, or re results is equal to int x uh, plus int y, and we'll say return results. Let's try that and go through here. And what am I doing here? Result of index print. Oh, because I didn't even call the function print add. There we go. There we go. Print add. There we go. Two. All right. So uh, we've got that working. And now I can do a test, so I can go to PyTest, and I can say from main import add, and then just write a, a test function, def test, 
add and then say assert that two is equal to add one and one. And now to, to run this, I can just type in make test. Now look, I didn't fill this out yet, so I need to go to my make file and I need to take this out. And we can just say, let's just run anything with the word test in it. That will be more clear. Now if I do make test, there we go. We can see that my test uh, actually passed. If I wanted to, I could also add coverage of, of, of testing as well. Uh, and so there's a tool called PyTestCov like this. And if I do make install, we can add that and then do the pip freeze command to grab it. PyTestCov, grab that just like that and then we can do close this and then go to the make file and say dash dash cov equals and just put main right so basically show me what coverage there is on the main file so so this is this is essentially getting continuous integration working locally now if i do a make lint this will look at all the python files right it'll say what is it what is it complaining about here it is saying that's not a git repository or any parent directory so not sure why that is it's having some issues here but it, it should it should work let's see make make lint here let's try one more time make lint oh because i'm not in the directory that's why <laughs> so i so i need to i need to uh, uh a couple things i i screwed up here is that i didn't um i put these direct these files outside of my my directory so i'm going to just move them real quick so i'll say mv main to devops mv make file to devops mv and let's see what else mv requirements to devops and then mv tests to devops right so pretty easy to do is to forget to change it to the directory your code is in but that's actually why the the git based approach is is kind of neat to look at git to, to make sure that that's what actually looks at the files so if i do make lint here uh well in theory that should have worked what does it say now as it says that's pilot hmm, i don't error don't know why that's not working it, it should it should work here let's just try to run pilot itself oh close all let, let, let's just let's uh let's do a make install make sure everything is installed that looks good and then let's let's actually run the pilot by itself without all of its fancy stuff and we'll just say asterisk.py what does that do well and now if i do make lint what happens make lint yeah not sure why that that is having an issue but i can just change it to this sometimes you can get too fancy and and, and your code will 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 make it worse for you so now if i type in make lint there we go so we have our linting works our testing works if i type in make format um in this case as well we we would potentially want to change this for some reason that git command is not working we would want to do this we would say make format there we go and it, it was able to format all of our code uh, now that I've got basically all the stuff working, we have testing working, linting working, formatting working, then I can check all this in. So I'll say get status. So we'll add those files. So we'll add the make file, add the main file, add the requirements file, add the test file, commit this, adding uh, CI setup for DevOps, like that's 
then I just need to do my first git config. Again, these are just one-off things. The first time you build a project, you have to do. And then we go through here and we do this and then we can uh, um, just basically I'm doing it doing what it's telling me to do so and now I do a git push there we go so now that I've got this pushed I can go back to this repo refresh it we should see new files and here's what would add in the continuous integration step right and this is now getting into DevOps which is I want to do this automatically every time I run my code so in order to do that I would click on this button actions here. You can use any build system. This one happens to be an easy one to set up. If I click on actions here, you can see all these different things that you can do, but I'm going to go ahead and just set one up myself. And uh, I'm going to basically just uh, pull, pull down a project that, that I have uh, worked on recently that might have some good stuff in there. Let's see. Let's grab... Uh, Let's see if I can grab a, a Git a, a Git version here. This looks kind of interesting. Let's see if this one might work. So this is this is basically. Uh, let's not do Python three ten. Let's just do Python three seven, three eight, three nine. So this would test what versions of Python, and we would do a make install, which we just did. We would do a make lint, and then do a make test, and then do a make format. So this looks good. I'm going to go ahead and commit this. And now if I click on actions, it'll go through here and it'll build this out. Okay. It's testing all three, three, seven, three, eight, three, nine. And let's go ahead and take a look. We can even look at the, the, the process as it's going. It's looking good. It's got the installation set up. And what's great is it's actually testing the versions of my code. Okay, good. looks like everything's building successfully for these three different versions of Python. I think this is always a good idea too, is to create a status badge. So copy this. And now we've got essentially almost all of DevOps, right? Again, D DevOps is basically automation. We have local continuous integration. What, what would be the final step to, if you were going to do more more to this would be if I went back here and I was going to do a deploy and I have examples of this in my GitHub is I could just add a step here that did something like this that said deploy and, and it could just be as simple as as uh, echo you know deploy command goes here and that that is continuous delivery right and and uh, in some sense it's kind of a, an easy concept Right, and so if I said make all, right, install my code, lend my code, test my code, format my code, and then what again, whatever build, whatever deployment system I'm using or whatever process, I go through there and I do the deploy. Let's go ahead and say get uh, pull. Let's grab it, commit, adding placeholder for deploy. Okay. Get add make file adding deploy placeholder. Okay. All right. So now all I need to do is say get clone to that repo, cd into there like this, and and now I just do the 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 thing that I did earlier, which is I can look at the make file. And it has essentially everything necessary for me to run. I can just say make all. So let's go ahead and do that. And we'll say make all like that. And so this will go through here and install uh, everything necessary uh, using this, the same technique I covered earlier. It'll also go through and uh, lint our code, format our code, and, and, and do everything necessary. Okay, let's get this thing working. All 
Okay, so everything worked here. I was able to test it locally. Now, what are the core components in more of an MLOP style project? If, if we take a look here, the, the, some of the core components would be that I have a library. And if I look inside of here, I have this utils uh, directory. I also have a lib right here. And inside this lib, let me just walk through some of the code I have. Now, this is, I, I think, in a way, maybe not necessary, some of this code, if you're using a framework. But this is very explicit in that I'm just you know, explicitly doing things like loading a model off of disk, right? Again, there's other frameworks that handle this for you, but this just shows you the, the concepts. I load in some data. I have some retraining steps right here, model.joblib. Uh, I format the input. Maybe I reshape the NumPy array to be the format that I need. I scale the input. So basically all machine learning models require some kind of scaling for the most part, except for things like decision trees. And then uh, I scale the target. I then do, you know, human height. I then make a payload right here, which predicts the value. Uh, and uh, we, we, can, we can actually go from there. And then if I go through here and I say uh, predicts, this predict function right here will actually uh, go through here and, and load the model. Let's go ahead and uh, take a look at this. We, we've got this, this actually in, in, inside of here, looking at the input, scaling the input, uh, scaling the prediction, and, and also uh, going through and giving us a human readable payload. And then also I actually go through and put in the predicted values right here. So we've got all of these things inside that uh, are really doing the work for us. Then if I go to the main here, which if we go through here, uh, inside of this, we'll close that one. Inside of the, the uh, let's see here, let's go to app. Let's go to the app. The app is where I would actually build out some kind of a microservice. In this case, this is a Flask microservice. And what I do is I have a beginning route here, which is able to serve out the prediction. I have a predict, which actually goes through here and it serves out a, a prediction uh, by, by pulling in a, a predict library code. And then I actually serve this out right here. So you, you can easily build out many different kinds of ways to invoke this by using that library. If I go to a command line tool, I also can invoke things by using a command line tool by actually uh, just using the click library and, and allowing someone to pass in the weight. So I actually like this approach, which is I give somebody the ability to both uh, invoke things via the command line tool or I let them invoke it via a, uh, a, a microservice. So let's first use the command line tool. So if I go through here and I just type in CLI like that, and I do help, this should give me the ability to take a look at the uh, menu here. And it shows me that I would just need to pass in the weight and it's text. So pass in the weight of a major league baseball player to predict the height. So if I go through here and I say uh, weight, 200 pounds, probably your six foot two. And notice what I did as well as I added, because I used the click library, uh, which is a, a chameleon tool parsing library, that I'm able to actually add style as well. So this is one of the nice things about using a high, a, like a high level library like this is that depending on what it is I'm doing, I can add nice, lots of nice you know touches here like coloring the output. So now that I've got the command line tool working, what else can I do? Well, what I could do is I also could run a web service. And in this particular scenario here, we see all this, right? We've got this web service. So let's go ahead and, uh, and do Python app like that. And notice that it'll run here in foreground mode. And so it's gonna be running on port 00 uh, uh, and 8080. Now, how would we invoke this? Now, what I typically do is I'll either write a shell script to invoke it, or I'll use 
a, um, a library. Again, there's other frameworks that actually are now evolving that make all this stuff very easy. But just to explicitly show you how I would do it, let's take a look at this prediction function here. And you can see what it does is I define a port, I echo this port out, and then I just run a curl command right here. And so this curl command will then pass this into to, to our microservice. So if I go here and I say new terminal, what I can do is I can just say um, bash predict like that. Actually, first let's change it to the directory. So Python and say bash predict. There we go. And we can see from our web service right here that it's actually able to, to do that prediction. And that's one way I can invoke it. I also could uh, invoke it by using a utility. And I have another function here, which is called utils CLI. And this shows you how you could also build your own utilities type of command line tool that could actually invoke it. So here, here we see an example of uh, what 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 you potentially could do so first i import my library which has all the the work in there i then have a uh, an example here where i do a retrain so let, let's let's try that out so let's let's stop this for a second and then let's let's actually run this tool called utils cli so we'll say utils cli and we say dash dash help notice that it has the ability to either do predictions or it has the ability to retrain the model. What I'm going to do is I'm going to retrain it. So I'm going to say retrain. And notice when I retrain, by default, it'll actually change the test size. right? So I just pick a little bit less data. Maybe I want to experiment with how that affects the accuracy. I retrain it, look, and it created a new file that lives on disk called model.joblib. So this, this could be something that I could see you know, somebody doing in an organization is, is kind of wrapping some of their library code, wrapping some of their things together and allowing you to do a retrain here so that now I can use that new model and serve that model out. And 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 notice if I do an ls-l of the model job lib, look, we can see that it was just modified, right? And, and in fact, if I even did a get status, you'll see that... In theory, that it should have, I'm not sure why that is not showing up in my git status, but bas basically it's showing that that model has actually been, uh, has been changed here. If I do ls-l, it, it may be that in my git ignore, I said to ignore the, the model file, which I think I did. But, but basically that's a new, that's a new model file uh, right here that's on disk. And I could even uh, retrain it with different options as well. So I could do dash dash train size and then do, how about, let's do 0 0.3. Let's try that. There we go. And here's our new accuracy. So, so the idea here would be that you would train the model to, to kind of experiment with which one. It looks like this one is probably the best accuracy. And, and, and then you can see here that it's going to change that one on disk. Now, if I just go back here, this should just pull that up from disk because if we look at the app code, all it's doing, actually it's in the model lib, all it's doing is it's, it's, it's loading the model off of disk. And so if I go ahead and I say Python app, it loads the, the new model. And then if I want to run a prediction now, what can I do? Well, I can actually new, use the the prediction capability built into this command line tool. So we can say predict. Let's go ahead and do that. Let's say, let's go ahead and run predict and then do help like that. And we see that in fact, oh, okay, we need to pass in an integer to the weight. Okay, let's go ahead and do that. Let's pass in weight and we can do 200. And there we go. It's going to actually pass this in to our, to our, um, our endpoint. So it actually called that endpoint. So I think this is also kind of a good idea too, is to to build tools that allow you to interact with your production uh, system here. Now notice if we go to this utils function here, look at what, how I did this. So I, I created a, a command called predict, 
which takes options weight and host. Notice that right here, what's cool about this is that it defaults to localhost because that's typically where I would develop my code. But we can actually make it more sophisticated by actually uh, deploying to a production endpoint, right? And so in this case, uh, I could change this out. So let's actually go ahead and do that. So what I'm going to do next here is I'm going to shift gears and go to uh, AWS, and I'm going to deploy to something called AWS App Runner. And App Runner is one of my new favorite services because it makes it very trivial to install things. Now, in order to do this, though, I'm going to do a container-based work, workflow, which is the easiest possible way to deploy. So I'm going to type in ECR for Elastic um, Container Registry, Fully Managed Docker Container Registry. And, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to create a repository. And we'll call this uh, MLOps and uh, go ahead and create a repo. There we go. So we got a, a repo named MLOps. If I go down here and I grab it, MLOps, how do I push my container here? All I need to do is say view push commands like that. And now I can just literally paste these inside uh, of, my, of my project and, and get this running. So what we could do, in fact, if we want to get kind of fancy, is that uh, I could even put this into a make file if I wanted to, and I could even add like a deploy step uh, into this particular uh, project. And then later I could even do continuous delivery with with this project. So let's let's go ahead and uh, try that out. Let's go ahead and do a, a deploy here like this. And we could do that. So we could say, here's my Docker command. There we go. And then the next step, it can put a documentation and say like push to ECR for deploy. How about that? So we do we do that. And then I go to the next command, which is do the Docker build. And then let's go ahead and do this. Okay. And then let's do the next command, which is the Docker tag. And the next one we do is Docker push, right? And so what's nice about this is that these are the four commands necessary to, to, to do a continuous delivery. So let's go ahead and do this. Let's type in make deploy. So it's logging in. Um, let's run it again. Make deploy. Now, why did it not do this, these, these steps here? That's the push DCR, get login. So, so I logged in. Let's let's just let me do it uh, manually then. So let's go ahead and try this out. We'll say Docker build. Yeah, I'm not sure why that didn't run. Did I did I make a typo or something? I'm not sure why. And then we can do a Docker tag next here. Okay. There we go, Docker tag. And then we do a Docker push, our final our final command here, which would push it to ECR. Now, because we're on AWS already, it should do a very fast push, which is one of the reasons to develop in the cloud is so when you do uh, container to, to container pushing, that it actually is pretty easy to, to get that set up. Okay, it pushed the change. Now let's go back to ECR here. And if I refresh, you can see that this image is actually living inside of this uh, this this uh, scenario right here, latest. Uh, and, and we can go ahead and take a look at this. So 
once I've got that set up, what's great is I just go to uh, the app runner here, and that's basically all of the, the work essentially. So if I go ahead and I say create an app runner service, what we can do next here is uh, tell it to look at the container registry itself. We can also go through here and and then give it the ECR uh, you know URL. So how do we do this? We just browse and we just go to MLOps right there and I can just say continue. And, and, and what's really sophisticated about this is that's essentially the heart and soul of doing continuous delivery is, is to actually use this. And now under deployment settings, if I wanted to, I can even select automatic. And every time I push a new container, maybe using the code build system from AWS, that it'll actually automatically de deploy. So I'm gonna use one, I've already set up a, a role. I'm gonna do automatic and we'll call this MLOps. And uh, I don't really need to do anything else. I'm, my service is gonna use this port because that's actually where I'm running my Flask application. It's gonna listen to what Docker container is actually serving out. It'll auto scale, it'll do health checks, it'll do security, networking, even it can even do observability, right? So you can actually trace your application, uh, which is kind of cool. And so if I go ahead and I say next, I scroll down here, it'll do create and deploy. So this really is a pretty cool process because it takes something that is a little bit tricky, uh, taking a microservice that has a machine learning model in it, and it just scoops it up because it talks directly to the containerized environment. So for many, I think for many scenarios, this is a, a great scenario because you could take, for example, even a pre-trained model from, let's say, Hugging Face or from TensorFlow Hub or wherever, and slurp that in, and then push this into AWS App Runner and actually do a do a prediction, uh, and, and and it's and actually f f completely automatic. So, in fact, while this is creating, let's see if we can debug the the make deploy step here. So I don't know why this. Um, that was having an issue. That looks correct though. Let's go, let's go ahead and do that. Let's see, make deploy. Let's see what it does. Your password will be stored. Configure a Docker to remove this credential warning. Oh, let's save this. Let's go ahead and go back to Cloud9 console. Let's get this thing. Here we go. Open this up. <clears throat> no, that's the wrong, that's the wrong environment. This is going to be DevOps for MLOps, that's the one I was in. Here we go. Yes, let's reload it. Ah, okay. So uh, I think I didn't save it. That's that's all it is. That that was so that made that that makes a lot more sense. Is I just never saved this. So let's go ahead and go to the console here, and uh, let's go to the ECR, which is right here, container registry, and let's find that MLOps repo, here we go, and I just look at the push command, so so for whatever reason, I just didn't, I didn't have it saved, there we go, so build it, and then go to the next step here, which is this, copy this, go to the next step here, and do a do a push. There we go. So so in theory, once this is set up, this is all I need to do to do continuous delivery because it will build the container because the Docker file lives in my repo right here, and, and it will just build this and push this container automatically to to my environments, uh, which is ECR, which that will then trigger 
the, the build process for App Runner. So let's go ahead and refresh this real quick. We can see that what's happening is first it creates a service, then it says uh, operation in progress. It then correct, successfully creates a pipeline for doing uh, automatic deployments. We then pull the image from ECR. Again, this is the source of truth, is the container registry. We, we then go in and deploy the, the image. Uh, and then it will go through and, and ask for port 8080 to uh, do a health check. And this is how the, the service knows it's going to be active, is it waits to see if the health check is successful. Once it's, it's successful, then it says, oh, yep, that's good. Let's go ahead and route the traffic to the application. And so it's pretty close to being delivered. Now, notice you can also go to CloudWatch and in CloudWatch will let you look explicitly at the logs. And here we go, we can see all the different things inside of here as well. So if you had bugs or issues with your application, you could actually go through there and, and, and check those out. In this case though, I think we're pretty close to being able to do a prediction. And look, here's the service. If I click on the link, look, it's already running. And I can, I can make that a little bit bigger. So one of the things that we can do now that this service is actually running is I go back to this environment. Remember I had that, that tool, right? Which is the utilities tool. This is where it comes in handy is if I say utils and I say predict dash dash help, notice that it's going to ask the host here would be, would be, would, would be the thing I would actually fill out. So I just need to look really quick at, look look how I call it, I, I do this URL. So we would just need to create like a variable like this. We'd say dollar sign uh, to, to or, or we would say URL equals, and, and then I would just put in the full path to where this microservice lives. Let's see, I think this thing is ready to go. Yeah, it's it's running. I would grab this and put put a slash predict on the end of it. So we'll go back to here, say this slash predict, right? See how we just need to match that. And now if I say echo dollar sign URL, there we go. That looks like it works. And I can actually um, go ahead and, and run that with my with my utils predict. So I can say utils predict host, and then we just do dollar sign URL. What happens? There we go. So we're able to actually run this into production now, which is this particular environment. And in fact, we can look at the activity right here. We can look at the metrics and, and I can even look at the logs and we should see that that API call was made uh, it should show up here. Retry. I may not be logging that particular message, but but we we are we are invoking it basically uh, from uh, from our utility here. Maybe this is an application. There we go. Application logs. We can see here uh, that everything is running. In fact, that's my my invocation right there. So. What I'm going to do is just keep moving forward here and finish up the continuous delivery. Uh, let's go ahead and do that. So let's go to here. And okay, so so we're inside of App Runner. We got it working. Now the the beautiful thing is that if we go to our AWS environment here, and I just uh, tweak it a little bit by adding a build spec file. Uh, and in fact, I can find one. Uh, let me just find a build spec.yaml file that, that I have that I can just copy because build spec is what the code build will actually use. And uh, build spec.yaml. And I'm going to go ahead and look inside of a repo here. So, so I can actually just show one of my repos real quick and let's go ahead and find this. I think I had one recently here, Databricks. Let's take a look at this one. Um, we 
we've we've got one here somewhere build spec in this user what do we got code here we go yeah this is it this this would be one so i'm going to go to build spec right here so it can be as simple as this just make all so let's go ahead and do that so i'm going to grab this and i'm going to go back to my development environment and i'm, I'm going to just put this inside of here so we'll say build spec dot yml like that and i'm going to just paste this code inside which just runs the make command now why is the make command enough because if we go back to this make file look i just needed to say install lint test format and then deploy so basically this will run all of the the pipeline for the deployment and do continuous delivery of my machine learning model so i i should have two files that have changed let's go ahead and do a get status aha we do make file and build spec.yaml let's check those in so get add make file get add build spec and we'll say uh, continuous delivery of uh, model via ecr to aws app runner nice so now that we've got this set up all i need to do is go to a, a new environment which is my aws code build this is the build server for aws and so this would be a native continuous delivery process because i'm using uh, cloud9 to develop I'm then using the ECR to host it, the container, and then App Runner uh, to actually go through and, and run it. So let's go ahead and create a build project, and we'll call this one MLOps, and we'll say continuous delivery. We'll just say CD of uh, sklearn model. There we go. Let's enable the build badge. Now, where do I want the code to live? I'm going to say GitHub right here and it's going to be a, a repo in my account this should take just a second for this to populate okay so we'll say no gift um python ml ops cookbook perfect and then i'm going to rebuild every time a change is is pushed to this repo right because i want to do continuous delivery every time i make a change and now i also need to, to pick the kind of machine that will build my code now because i'm running in aws cloud 9 i already have flushed out the the fact that it will work well so i would just pick amazon linux 2 which is what cloud 9 is in i would pick the runtime here i would go through here and uh, just pick the latest we do need to select this flag because I am going to build a Docker container. So we'll build that. I already created a service role. So this would be your IAM role. So basically you need something that has privileges to interact with whatever it is you're doing. In this case, I need something to be able to push to ECR. So I already have one built, built up here uh, that I can use. Uh, if you needed to set it up yourself, you just go to the IAM system and set that up. I'm going to use a build spec file, which is again right here, build spec. You notice it has to be at the root of your directory called buildspec.yaml. And that's all I need to do. So if I say create build projects, uh oh, cannot exceed quality policies per role. Uh, policies per role. Okay, I don't know. Policies cannot exceed quota policies per role. Hmm. Oh, maybe. Let's, I don't know what that is. That must be something for me doing too many demos. Let's go ahead and take a look. Uh, what does it say? It's some kind of warning about... Hmm. Well, let's try a different role. <laughs> so so I can try a different role here. Or, or I could just create a new one. In fact, let me just create a new role. Let, let's just do that. Let's let's go here. And I'm going to go to IAM. I, I don't know why it's giving me that, that issue. 
but I'm going to need the ability to push to, I'm going to go to roles and uh, we're going to create a role and this is going to allow an AWS service. That's exactly what I want. And we are going to use code build. So here we go, AWS code build. And um, we want this to call services on my behalf. That's exactly what I, and what do, what do we want to call? Well, we just need it to push to ECR. So I'm going to type in ECR here, uh, which would be the container registry. So elastic container, let's go, here we go. We just need to, we want this one. We want uh, Amazon Elastic Container Registry. Yeah, we, we want to, to public, we don't, but this isn't a public one. I think we want private, public power user, public full access, registry public, to ECR public repos, hmm, public, uh, well, in this case, just to make things easier, let's just give it an admin role, and I can figure out the fancy stuff later, uh, we would want to say, Let's let's see what this one is. Um, basically, ECR, EC2, EC2, code commits. So this is a sysadmin, but we want we want an admin policy. Admin, right. If I look here, we could. Well, what I can do is let, let's let's find a different role that I've already got here, um, which should be okay. We want one for code build. Here we go, code build. Let's let's pick this one, February twenty first, uh, code build admin. That looks good enough. Uh, just so I don't fumble around here. So let's go back to role to modify so it can be used. We're we're going to pick in this one. We want to do code build February. This one. Let's pick this one, and let's hopefully that fixes it. There we go. We did. All right. So we we fixed this. So now the next step I'm going to do is I'm gonna push a change to see if it actually gets deployed. Because if we go back here, we can see that this thing is running. So how do we actually do a deploy to it? All I need to do is just, is basically is make a change inside of the repo and push it. So what we could do is actually go to the application here and where it says predict the height from weight we, we, we can add a maybe a step here or, or a little note that says CD, right? So I know that I added continuous delivery. So we'll go ahead and say get status, get add app, commit this, adding deployments. Okay, if we go ahead and we push this, what happens, it should trigger this code build so let's go to the build project. There we go. Look, we're now doing a continuous delivery and we can actually take a look at this and see exactly what's happening in terms of the deploy. We'll go ahead and tail the logs here. This should take just a second. And I'm assuming this will probably work, which would mean that we have full continuous delivery where every time I make a change, it'll rebuild a container, push the container to ECR. Once ECR is is is, is um, has the container, then it triggers the app runner. So basically, let's sketch this out just to make it really really clear what's going on while that thing is building. So, what did we do, and why is it so cool? 
so we, we set up full continuous delivery by uh, first using the Cloud9 environments, which really is key because the Cloud9 allows us to test in the environment that it would deploy or similar, right? Because this is AWS um, Linux. Once I've got this set up, then uh, I added a build spec file right here, build spec dot yml. What, what did that do? It tells the code build, so AWS code build, that it can actually build containers for me. Here we go, we go ahead and could we go here? And that pushes to ECR. ECR is the Elastic Container Registry. We have App Runner, which is our platform as a service offering, and it now is able to receive that notification that there's a new container, say new right here. Once we've done that, we have full MLOps continuous delivery, full MLOps continuous delivery. Uh, which is which is really cool, right? Because this is fairly replicatable across lots of different models. I just was using in this case second learn, but it could the model really could come from anywhere, and, and it's relatively straightforward once you once you've got this this style set up. So let's go back now to our code build. There we go. Look, the build has been pushed. Well, how do we know? Well, let's go to. Um, Let's go to actually the ECR and let's let's look at it. We'll say uh, Elastic Container Registry and, and 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 look at the last change for MLOps. Here we go. In fact, we we just pushed it right here. Right, that that change has just been pushed. So that in turn, there we go. It started the deployment process for our application. So uh, once what will what will happen when it's deployed is that our microservice should have a slightly different payload for at least the root path. And so we can go ahead here, we can refresh this. Operation is in, in, in progress. And and even we can verify that, look, it said uh, basically provision instance and deploy an image, performing health check. Status is going to running, and now it says deployment process has started again. So again, we know the steps here will be that it will, it will do several uh, processes. It'll create a pipeline for automatic deployment. It'll pull the image from ECR, uh, and uh, that's what it's doing right now. So it's going through here, and, and, it's, and it's setting this up. So let's just give this a few seconds here. To, to do our final continuous delivery. There we go. So it pulled that new image that I pushed uh, into ECR. Then it's going to provision the instance and deploy that image, which I hopefully, there we go, is able to do that. And then it's going to do health check next. There we go. There's a health check. And then after the health check, it should do a routing of the traffic to the application, which should be coming pretty soon. So once that's available, then this URL, if we click on it, should, ah, there we go. It, well, it should return back the CD here. That's when we'll know it'll be, it'll be successful. So I think it's still deploying though. Maybe that's cached in my browser. Let's, um, go back to here. So if I do watch, let's do this, curl. Now I don't know if it's, I wonder if it's cached actually until it's fully deployed. 
which may be why we're, 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 we're seeing that cast value here. There we go. Health check, routing traffic to the application. Still doing the deployments. We can look at the application logs here. So it does, it does look like it's deployed, but anyway, in, in a nutshell, it, it looks like the deployment is, is being able to be successful and, and all triggered again by, by automatically pushing the, those changes from the ECR repo. So now that we've got the continuous deployment stuff uh, set up, I think the next thing to cover would be to get into some of the platforms next. And uh, the, I would say in terms of platforms here, I think we'll have time for a few and uh, don't have a ton of time, but we have time for a few of these. So let's, let's just talk about the ones that we can cover really quick. So, so one of them in, in terms of MLOps platforms, uh, I think let's cover three. So MLOps platforms. So the three that I think I can cover will include um, first Databricks, Databricks. The second one will be after Databricks, SageMaker. And then the other one will be ML Run, ML Run, right? So these, this, this looks like a, a decent amount of platforms here and so this would be spark based and this is aws based and this is kubernetes based right so we've got three totally different flavors of platforms that we can experiment with with so let's let's shift gears then and try out now that we've got continuous delivery set up let's try out a databricks so how would we do this well i'm going to start with azure so azure actually has a first party integration with databricks and the way I would typically do it is to go to Azure, go inside of here, click on uh, Azure Databricks, and then just pick some kind of demo, uh, you know, or, or create a demo uh, workspace here, right? Once I've launched it, then it basically uh, it invokes a completely different environment where I'm essentially not even in Azure almost anywhere. I'm just inside of Databricks and I can do all kinds of things. Now, what are the key components of their platform? They have notebooks, they have auto ML. Those are, those are some of the key components here. And also they have compute. So this is where we get into the cluster. So if I go down here and I'm under the machine learning tab here and I go to compute, uh, what I would need to do to, to run this uh, is create a cluster. Now, typically the cluster, the thing to be aware of is that you would wanna pick a machine learning runtime and potentially the, like a, a GPU or non-GPU runtime, depending on what it is you wanna run. Uh, and this would allow you to run the latest uh, code. Now, I already have a cluster I created earlier, which is a 10.5 cluster. And I can just say basically start and it'll just wake it back up again. So this will take just a second and it'll, it'll, it'll spin up a Spark cluster here that allows me to do work with it. You can see here, these are machines that have each of them 14 gigs of memory, four cores, and it will it will basically spin up and down depending on how much work that I need to do. So there's a cluster, there's also a workspace. So if I go through here and I say workspace, this is where I would actually go through and maybe you know create a notebook, or I could create a library, or I could create a folder, an experiment, uh, again, this whole idea here is so that you can share things with other people. Uh, in, in my particular example here, if I go ahead and I say create notebook, you can you can also decide the languages, right? Python, Scala, SQL, R, all of these are, are are good places to to play around with that. Now, the other thing that is worth pointing out here is that there are other components, including data, and this is where really the, the database uh, tables or the DBFS uh, come into play is that you have to uh, have a cluster available in order to access your data. So this, you know, there's pros and cons to this approach. Like if you, 
you know, because you have to physically manage the cluster, in some sense, you have more control. On the other hand, it, it can be cumbersome to always need a cluster available. And you have to, again, kind of wait for this thing to to wake up before you actually use it, uh, which which is potentially less less useful depending on what it is you do. Once you've got that set up, the other thing you can do is you can actually uh, go through here and do experiments, uh, also use their feature store, which would keep track of their, their features, and, and also keep track of uh, models as well. So in this case, look, we see that this model is actually already served out into production, and it's running uh, inside of this environment. And in fact, uh, it, it's ready for us to use if I if I wanted to make requests to it. If I wanted to, to use this model for inference or prediction, I could just go ahead and click on this and I could either do batch-based inference or real-time. If I did real-time, it'll actually put it behind a, a cluster and allow me to do predictions. Of course, that would that would cost money to, to do that. Uh, but you can see here how this is really the, the view of the world here. Uh, the way the way things kind of get set up here. So if we go through here and we look at uh, compute here, uh, we would just need to wait for this thing to to be available before we're able to actually to actually use it. Now, uh, one of the things that I'll point out while this thing is spinning up is that we can compare this now with AWS SageMaker. So so this might take like five minutes for it to spin up. So what I can do instead is I can shift gears here and uh, and spin up right next to it uh, a SageMaker environment. So let's go to um, console here and let's go to the uh, region that I have my SageMaker inside and we can see here, here's AWS SageMaker. So SageMaker has some of the, the same kind of concepts. The, the idea here is that you would build, you would train, and you would do a deploy of machine learning models uh, at scale. And you look at, there's these different features of the SageMaker platform. We have the ability to do labeling, we have notebooks, processing, training, inference. There's a lot of different features here. But in particular, SageMaker Studio and Canvas are, are some of the new things that are, that, are, that are popping up. So this is generate a machine learning model with no code. Okay, let's go ahead and launch this up and let's go ahead and take a look at it. We can see here, this is the, uh, the, the Canvas application. And we can see that Amazon SageMaker Canvas provides a visual point and click interface that allows business analysts to, to build uh, machine learning without a line of code. And so we can go here and we can, we can take a look at this thing. So let's go ahead and, and uh, get this thing running and launch the app launch canvas so this is a new service that's built on top of it so a lot of the the platform vendors have these kinds of features in this case SageMaker canvas is yet another example of a uh, a uh, a tool that's getting higher and higher level and i think we're going to see this as the future is that these fully automated systems uh, make it easy to to build out solutions and and then you can focus more on the on the business development side of things. So let's let this thing uh, create real quick. All right, well, this thing is running. I can probably set up a third environment let me just get that real quick. And so now that I've got two environments set up, let's get a third now, which is uh, I'm going to create, I'm going to log into the Aguasio platform. And so this is the, the ML run platform. Uh, and and it, it also has kind of similar characteristics. We got project management, we got a feature store, we got data and ML run, we have ML functions. And, and, and in a similar way, what you would probably want to start out with is if you look at all these different uh, concepts, is if we go to the projects, we, we would potentially want to look at a, a get started project here and notice some of the, the key features of this is that we could see different jobs that are running. We could see what models we've actually produced. 
and, and we also can look at the different um, accuracy metrics, training runs. So really, it's it's a comprehensive system here that allows us to again, we can see a model endpoint. I can serve this out, do drift analysis, feature analysis. Uh, so so really, it's holistically looking at the whole pipeline, like in a way, almost like GitHub for source code. ML Ops platforms holistically uh, give you give you that access. So let's let's um, toggle back to our cluster here in in um, in Databricks. Now that we we've spun this thing up, and then I'll, I'll I'll shift again back to those two other platforms. So we we have a cluster running. What can we do with it? Well, one of the things that we can do is we can we can actually run experiments uh, with this cluster. Uh, that's that's one of the things that we can do. And so if I wanted to, for example, say create an auto mill experiment, uh, that's that's one of the ways that I could use this. So I could take a cluster, in this case, MLOps cluster, and I could go through here and say what kind of problem I want to solve. Maybe it's, uh, uh, you know, something that lives on disk here. Uh, let's go ahead and see what we've got available. And we see that I think there's no databases, no tables. So, so here we go, database. Uh, we have uh, we have some built-in built-in stuff that we could use potentially. Uh, here's a people database. Let's go ahead and select that. And so we would now need to select the prediction target to do auto ML. Uh, and in this case, what could we predict? Let's predict maybe the gender, right? That would be a good one to 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 do a prediction to. We can predict gender, and we can make an experiment. So, like, can we predict based on the salary data? what someone's gender is. Okay, let's go ahead and click this start auto ML, and then I'll go through here and, and start training our model automatically. What is useful about this style is that it's leveraging the, the distributed computing aspects of Spark, is leveraging the platform so that I can actually see things like every single experiment that's being run, right, right here and historically. Now, look, if I go through here and I look at one that I run be, ran before, right, we can look at, in fact, oh, look, here's all my different experiments. Here's actually the, the code that I used. Here's the model that was created. And I can actually go back to the actual notebook here, and, and we can just put this into uh, this, this uh, cluster to, to run it. And it, it will show me all of the code that was used to actually generate this particular model. So there's a there's a nice uh, lineage here where everything is completely reproducible and you can see all the different things that I did to, to build out this model. And then again, if I go back to the experiments tracking here and I look at this model that was the best model that was produced, this is what I think is kind of cool is that look, it gives you the structure where the model lives. Like here's the model, here's the config file, you know, here's all of the metadata associated with it. And then it shows me also how I could actually make a prediction on this particular model. So if I wanted to do a prediction on a Spark data frame, I would just do this. I would say import ML flow. I would pass in this log model. I would load the model as a Spark UDF. And then I would do a prediction on it. I could also do a prediction on a pandas data frame. So we could try that out. Let's let's see if we can get that working. So if I go ahead and I um, um, potentially open up a, a second window here. Let's do that. Let's go through here and let's open up a, a second window. I guess I could go to my workspace, go to the M end in model and and we can just uh, attach this that's good and so i believe all i need to do is just copy what they're telling me here and if i just put this into the first cell right here right we could just put a um, some code in there and i paste this in what happens does this work run cell this should be able to uh, it says, uh oh, data frame is not defined. And so I believe we'll need to import the right library. So we'll need to import Spark here. So let's Spark, Spark, Spark. 
So let's find another workspace. Model Quick Start. I think we want to import. There's NumPy, ML Flow. We we want to Im import PySpark, which I can find here. Data frame. So scikit-learn so NumPy. Trying to find from load data. Well, we can do we can do pandas. We don't have to do this, but let's just do this. We'll import pandas as df, and we'll go back to the model I was just working in, which was where is that model? Right. Let's grab yeah. Let's just grab this one. Predict on pandas data frame. So. Yeah, I don't know why that didn't load. They didn't import Spark for us. That's probably the issue. But let, let's copy this. Let's go back to, let's go to this notebook. Workspace. And in example. There we go. And we can just change this to this. And we import pandas. And we do a prediction. Does it work? Run cell. Data is not defined. Import pandas as data. Well, re regardless, the, the 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 concept, which it would take me a second to get this running, the concept is that I can load a model that was trained uh, previously. Probably the last thing that I'll that I'll mention here is if I go back to the experiments here, is that if I click on this, we can actually see. Uh, basically everything that's happening, how long it's been training, uh, and and that it'll run for 60 minutes. And as soon as I get some, look, we even have some preliminary results here. One of the cool things about it is that it'll, it'll even create a, a notebook for us as well. And so if I click on this notebook, it'll even let me do a data exploration uh, for the project. So if I go ahead and I run this cell, Look at this, it gives me basically the runtime. So that's probably the easier way to, to do this instead of doing what I was doing, which is fumbling around, is use the notebook they give you that's auto-generated, and then you can go through here and just play around with it. So again, what's cool about this from an MLOps perspective is I didn't have to do anything. It gives me a, an EDA notebook uh, automatically uh, for me, and, and then I can later use it to, to explore the model and, and, and try new ideas with it. So that's probably, I would say, the, the gist of some of the stuff you can do with Databricks. Notice that I have another repo that let me just show you that's, um, that, that has some of this in there. So if we go to ML, ML Flow, I think is what I have. So I have a, a repo here, ML Flow Project Best Practices. And inside of this repo, what I did was I downloaded a model I used with AutoML and I put it inside of here. And this is what I did was I pulled the data from Kaggle, uploaded it to Databricks, created an AutoML experiment, did the, the thing, and then I did this whole workflow where I containerized it and pushed it into production. And you can see, in fact, the code here to download the model was right here. I just went to this and I said, hey, give me the latest model artifact, pulled it down, grabbed it and then I was able to actually put that into into my my full uh, MLOps workflow. So that's that's like the 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 very quick tour of of Databricks. Now let's shift gears now and now go to Canvas and you can see here this is this drag and drop system for uh, AWS SageMaker and you can see it says haven't created new models. Okay, well how do we how do we do this? Well, first we need some data sets. You haven't imported any data. Let's go ahead and import some data. And then it's going to ask me either to upload the data or go to S3. Now, uh, because I've already, I, ha I have some data that is probably pretty good to use, I'm going to go to some NBA data, social power NBA right here. And this, I have some data on the NBA like this one, MBA 2017. This has got some social media data, plus it's got some some stats data. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to this file, or actually go to this um, thing right here, and I'm just going to I'm going to I'm going to copy it. So I'm going to say file, 
save page as, and we'll put this in as a CSV file. Then dot CSV. There we go. That looks good. And it, it is it, we're able to, to use that. So, so now that I've got that, I'm going to upload that CSV file. Oh, you so it, well, we can put it into S3 if it if it if it doesn't want me to do that, we can go ahead and go to import, go to S3, add a connection. Uh, let's see local files. Your, you or your admin needs to set up local file upload. Okay, let's let's do that. So give your users ability to upload local files. Choose the bucket. Hmm. Well, this this I've this is the first time I've used SageMaker Canvas. It looks like there's a little bit of work to do in order to do that. I can do that in the future. But the concept is gonna be a similar concept. You you upload it, you then find your models, uh, and then you 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 basically use AutoML for this. Uh, I guess you could also search and see if there's anything in here. Looks like it doesn't give publicly addressable models. So, uh, but it is, an, it is an interesting new service. There is um, the other part of SageMaker, which we can take a look at real, real quick here, which is the um, studio, which is the one that I've used for AutoML previously. And if we, we go to uh, East, East Ohio, let's go to this one. So if we launch um, studio here, and uh, we we open this thing, launch the app, studio. What's what's neat about this is it also can do AutoML, so you can say new AutoML uh, experiment, and we could just say you know NBA for example, and we could say find bucket, and uh, AutoML NBA I think. I think we need to find one that is basically available uh, for the region that we're in. So that's one thing to, to be aware of is that you have to pick the right region uh, and the data has to live in that particular in that particular region. Uh, and so we would have to find one that's US East 2. I guess I could go to S3 here and do that. We could go to console. Go to S3 and find scalable storage in the cloud. Make maybe a new bucket real quick. And look, see the region. This is critical. Is I would say the region that my SageMaker is in. And we can call this NBA test ML Ops 2022 or something like that. And just go ahead and, and create that bucket. And then I'll just take that file that I that I that I that I had NBA tests. Or actually, we can just go to the bucket. There we go. Here's the bucket. Let's upload the thing I just um, went through and, and created. Here's the NBA data, and go ahead and upload. Now that that's uploaded, if I go back here, we we should. Let, let's let's recreate it one more time. Let's go to new AutoML experiment. We'll call this NBA ML Ops 2022, 2022. Find, find that bucket, which should be NBA AutoML Ohio. Actually, that's not the one I created, but that should work because I, I um, because I, I believe I did this before. And then we would just type in this NBA data. We would select what target, so it could inspect my data automatically. And I could say I want to I want to predict what per position a player would play based on their statistics. And then uh, out that that's basically all I need to do. Output bucket. I believe we don't need. No, we do need this. We would say output bucket. Um, let's just call this. NBA AutoML Ohio, and let's do, go ahead and create it. So it says, are you sure you want to deploy the best model? So no, we don't want to do auto deploy because that will spin up charges. I just want to create the experiment and this will go through and it'll do AutoML. So you can see this is the, I, I think the future of a lot of these MLOps 
platforms is that automatic experiment creation and automatic tracking is is definitely part of all of them and you can see here that this will go through and it'll do all that now i believe that i, I might have had a solution here at one point that i could have taken a look at but, but anyway it's, it's going to go through and, and and build all this stuff for us the other last thing i'll mention is that another thing that's happening with SageMaker is that that they are building out these this concept of a uh, basically pipelines, and so you'll see this now with a lot of SageMaker projects. Is they're putting all of these steps together like I had already done, but in addition, putting in like deeper hooks into in, into basically the the SageMaker aspect of it. So you'll see it's kind of like what I did before with taking the container, but also building even further integration with SageMaker pipeline. So this would be more of like a production first mindset. So we did two platforms. Now the 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 third the third platform as I mentioned was is uh, a Guazio or ML run platform. And you can see it's got all these same kind of features and we can we can build stuff out with it. You can build pipelines, you can test all that stuff out, you can do auto ML. But one of the things that is kind of cool about it is that you also, if you go to ML Run here, that they, they also have an open source version of it. And I've been playing around with it a little bit. And one of the things that you can do is if we go to install ML Run, notice that you can actually run it with Docker as well. And so if you go to the quick start guide here and we make this a little bit bigger, you can also play around with their their platform uh, by just installing it in a notebook. So I was earlier today going through and I was building out a ML run project. So ML run ideas right here. And uh, with this pr particular project, wh what I was what I was playing around with was that, uh, I wanted to use Colab Notebook to try out some of the ideas that they have set up in their in their uh, Quick Start guide. So the first thing I do is I I use my Colab Pro environment. I go through and I change the runtime type, and I say let's say let's use GPU, let's use high memory, and uh, let's let's get this thing cooking. So what do we do first to to use ML Run platform? Is I can do this. I can say pip install ML Run. Let's go ahead and try this out. So this will install the whole framework for doing uh, ML ops, which is which is pretty cool. Uh, and what what is also nice about this is that I don't necessarily have to wait. Uh, you know, I don't have to actually use a, a you know in when I'm experimenting with it some platform. I can I can test it out on my local machine. Now this it looks like maybe a GPU environment's not available or something like this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this again. I'm going to change the, the runtime here. Let's change it to to just none high memory. Let's try that. Let's see if that works. Connecting to, okay, it's connected. Let's run this. It's going to install ML run. Here we go. We've got this thing installed. All right now, now once I've got this installed here, the next thing that we can do is download some data for 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 training uh, and, and trying out their platform. So we've got this going through ML Run Colab. I believe the if you use Colab itself, you'll you'll want to actually restart this because we're installing a lot of libraries and let's go ahead and uh, do that so pip install ml run okay there you go it says you must restart the runtime okay let's go ahead and and uh, restart runtime okay and now or actually we can just do it right there there we go so restart the runtime and I think that's all we need to do. So if we run it again, it's, it should just say like, oh, yep, we're already installed. 
Now, once I've installed it, then I can download the data. So these are some breast cancer data, training and serving code. And then we can start going through the quick start guide. And this one, we can see I import ML run and I can tell it don't use Kubernetes, just use local mode. There we go. That worked. Now I can define a project and functions. And so this goes through and it looks, uh, we, 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 we basically tell it what the, the code is we're gonna use to do uh, the, the prediction. Here's the trainer and here's the serving. And then we can go through and take a look at uh, basically what it would look like uh, when it's actually set up. And here's our project, here's our start. So it's got that same concept, right, of experiment tracking and and uh, invocation. And then if I wanna go through and I wanna do invoke invocation, invoke the model via command line tool, I would just pass in dash local. Uh, and in this case, I think it's gonna say, uh, I didn't build the model yet, uh, so so that one won't work. But I could print the artifacts, and it shows me all the different uh, prediction data about basically what was what was created. So this open source uh, ML run is also pretty neat. And if you want to play around with it, uh, again, you could just go to their their repo here, and there's a bunch of documentation on it. So. Uh, what I like about this one is it's got, if you're into Kubernetes and you want to play around with Kubernetes, it's got this, you know, deep hooks here for, for Kubernetes.